All right. So chapter, um, what is this chapter? What did we just finish? Just chapter seven? Holy mackerel, we are we're cooking here. We're just moving through this stuff. So, so I, I'll be honest with you, I skipped a bunch of slides that the, the, the textbook publisher put into the slide deck because I think they're all, it's all about what's called internal control and the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, which is a law that has to do with how businesses deal with their accounting and finance. And I think it's beyond the scope. Like if, if some of you go on to become accountants, you're going to take, you know, 300 level, 400 level, and then master's level courses in, in the law side of it. So other than to say Sarbanes-Oxley Act is still kind of the, the, the predominant law in how businesses handle internal control. And it has to do with how they report numbers. And it has to do with uh, also things like um, detecting fraud within your own business. In essence, what the law does is it makes the penalties less steep if a business will have a policy and follow that policy. That way, if one of their employees is stealing or embezzling or stealing from shareholders, if they have a policy and as soon as they find out they fire the person, then they can say, look, we did everything in our power to prevent this from happening. And so the penalties for the business will be less steep, less painful, I guess, than if they don't have these policies in place, okay? So just recognize that what businesses have to do is they have to think of ways to internally control their money. And so they have to have policies that say, if we receive cash from somebody, here's how we handle it. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, one, I, I handle finances at my church so as a volunteer. And so we have policies in place whenever people give us, oh, first of all, only three people at our whole church can receive donations from people. So we don't have like a pass along plate or anything. They give them directly to one of three people and they're in sealed envelopes. And then those sealed envelopes will not be opened unless there's at least two people present. When we open the sealed envelope, both people look at it. There's a, a donation slip where people say how much they're donating and to what, and then the money and the two people verify that what's on the donation slip matches the amount of money that's there. And then it's entered into the computer and then tallied up at the end, all the money's counted up at the end to make sure the two balances match. And then both people have to log in with a password to sign off on it. Then two people have to take it together to the bank, drop it at the bank and, and initial that they were the two that did it. So that's our process to make sure that the money's never alone, right? That there's always two people. That protects the individuals with the money because it's hard to accuse somebody of stealing if there's always been two people. Um, and it also protects the organization. Similarly, I'm the treasurer for our local AYSO soccer region here. Um, and that's, you know, it's a, we get a, a fair amount of money runs through there in our three month season, something like 70 to $90,000. And so you could see how somebody could, just try to take that money off the top. So what we've done is, first of all, we've implemented a system now where people don't pay in cash. So we used to have cash payers. Now people don't pay in cash. Everything's paid for online with a debit or credit card. So that reduces a lot of the risk. Um, we do get checks as donations sometimes for people. Same idea. Anybody, any member of the board can receive a check, um, which is hard. It'd be best if there was two people present but at least you can't really alter a check the same way. It's much harder, okay? So then we deposit that. When we pay money out, we never pay money out in cash. We always write a check and each check has to be signed by two authorized signers. And there's only like four people who are authorized signers. And so uh, one of them has to be the lead commissioner and then the treasurer or the, you know, the vice commissioner, one of those people. So that's what I mean when I talk about internal controls. You might have a few questions on your homework, um, but I don't, I don't think we need to go into it any deeper than that. Recognize that businesses put in place these internal controls. And mostly if you did it in real life, if you decide to go into accounting or finance, you're going to have to go to a place and you'll follow their policies, right? If it's a little business, say you start your own business, you may have to develop your own internal control policies. Um, and I would do a little research and just, just follow industry standards. And that's your safest bet. All right. So let's get into how we deal with cash. Okay. Some businesses, get a lot of cash. I don't know like what a Walmart, the amount of cash they bring in at a single Walmart in a day is, but it's a lot. Although I guess still probably more than half of their transactions are paid for with debit or credit, I would guess. So when we say cash, we usually mean coins, currency, checks, 
You guys know what a money order is? It's, it's like a check, except it's like a guaranteed check. Um, also, when we say cash, we usually mean money on deposit at our bank. So like the balance of my checking account, I would include that in what I call cash on my balance sheet. Um, but it has to be money that's available for withdrawal. So if I have like something like a certificate of deposit or something at the bank, I wouldn't include that with cash. That's a more of an investment. Um, and then this bottom bullet point, which is kind of obvious, cash is the asset most likely to be stolen or used improperly in a business. Why? Because it's easy, right? It's, it's super easy to steal and you don't have to try to sell it to somebody else. It's already cash. Let's see. All right. So typically when we receive cash, it's not, you know, it's, it's one thing if there's only, if it's like a one person business and the same person receives cash all the time. But if you're a retail store and you've got a whole bunch of people running cash registers, um, at the end of the day, sometimes you'll count up your cash and there'll be a discrepancy between the amount of cash your system says you should have and the amount you actually have. Sometimes you have more actually, believe it or not. You'll say if the cashiers give the wrong change, it happens, right? They, they give a little too much or a little too little, okay? And so normally if it's within certain tolerances, like we don't worry that much about it. Uh, some businesses are all hardcore. And like if, if, if you're running a register and you're off, they take it out of your pay, things like that. Um, especially, you know, but mostly it's like, hey, don't let that happen again. And if they start to see a pattern of that behavior, they'll get rid of the employee because they'll think they're stealing from them, right? So here in this case, uh, let's see, our cash reg register receipts total $35,690. When we count up the cash, we only have $35,668. As a percentage, that's a really tiny amount to be off, actually. Okay, you're talking, what, $22 out of 35,000. So you could probably live with that. And so what we use is a special account that's called cash short or over. So people always get confused on whether they should debit or credit this account. So here's how I go through this process. I just say, well, how much cash did I actually get? That's the debit to cash. That's how much my cash goes up. And then what does it say on my cash register totals? That's going to be my revenue account. And then I know that this thing has to balance, right? My debits have to equal my credits. So if this side, the debit side is smaller, then I'm going to be debiting the cash short and over account. Just so you know, debiting it means cash was short. Crediting it means cash was over. You had extra cash. Okay. And again, really, if you get confused, just look at the two numbers that you know, and then make it so the journal entry balances, right? If it needs a debit to balance, then you debit it. If it needs a credit to balance, then you credit it. Okay. That's all. I mean, that's, that's all. So this kind of just describes that whole thing. At the end of the accounting period, a debit balance and cash order over is included as a miscellaneous expense. Does that make sense? And if there's a credit balance, then it's going to be a other income. This actually happens sometimes. People overpay you. You try to get a hold of the customer. They don't respond. And so finally, you just say, I guess it's additional income to me. Uh, or somebody underpays you and you're trying to get a hold of them and they don't respond at some point, you just say, I'm going to take it as an expense and call it a miscellaneous expense. All right. So one of the biggest tools we have at our disposal, as far as keeping good internal control is our bank account. Like I mentioned with AYSO, we just have gotten to where we almost don't do anything in cash. Why? Well, because I don't, then you, there's, there's a, a much less chance of, of, of money disappearing, okay? If I only pay people with checks that have to have two people sign it, never deal with cash, that's much safer than if as a, you know, I always hate in my church responsibilities, like there's, there's always some dude who will like not donate anything all year and then like just walk up to me like in the middle of December and hand me an envelope with six or $7,000 in cash in it. And you're like, ugh. And, they'll, and of course, they'll come and drop it by your house on a Tuesday. And you're like, I have to hold this envelope with 7,000 in cash <laughs> till Sunday so I can get together. And again, if anybody was ever going to accuse you of wrongdoing, that would be the scenario, right? Especially, let's say I get there on Sunday and I open it with somebody else and it's $100 short. 
And it's going to be like, well, it was all there when I handed it to you. We have a couple of people at my church that just come by and like, just leave it at my house, give it to my wife. And she's like, I'm not supposed to have this. They're like, oh, it's okay. And so I come home and it's like sitting there on the kitchen table. Right. And I'm like, mm. My, my wife or my kids should not be taking donations from people. We should stick to the policies. So bank accounts allow us to just put that money straight in there and minimize the chance of having problems, okay? Work in as little cash as possible, if possible, if you're trying to improve your internal control. Um, and then, so what we're gonna talk about here is what's called a bank account reconciliation. This is this process by when you where you get to the end of the month and you get a statement from your bank, you can you try to match up and say, does the statement from the bank match up with or jive with what I have in my own books? Okay, because it won't all be there. Um, the numbers will be different. Recognize that sometimes uh, I can pay people with checks and they don't cash them right away. So my books will show that I've already paid that, but it won't have come out of my checking account yet. Anybody who's had a checking account has probably been surprised by one of those where you wrote a check a long time ago and forgot about it and thought you had lots of money and then all of a sudden someone deposits it and boom, your money drops way down. If you're careful and keep a good ledger, you'll know how much the balance should be even though it doesn't match with what, what says on your online banking, right? But most of us in today's world don't do that. We just use online banking. My kids even have so that every time a deposit or a debit or credit hits their bank account, it just sends them a text. So they always get a new balance, right? Um, so if they go get gas and then text me and say, hey, dad, I filled up the family car. Will you put some money on my account? As soon as I transfer it, they get a text with their new balance. And that's how we do a lot of things. But sometimes we pay things by check and then we thought that we had that money in our account and it's actually the person hasn't deposited the check. So reconciliation is where we try to account for all of that. Also, sometimes we deposit money in our account, but the statements have already been printed for that month. So on our books, it looks like we have, or we know we have more money in our account, but our bank statement's not showing that yet. This has changed a lot uh, in the modern world with uh, online banking. Um, I know for, for um, the soccer league, we use something called ZipBooks, which is a free tool. Um, and in essence, ZipBooks is tied into our, our checking account. And each time, something clears the check, it automatically enters it into zip books. And then I go in and, and sort of adjust it if I need to, or put any other details, or I can like, when I write checks, I can put them into zip books. And then once they clear, it'll pick that up from our checking account. And it'll say, are these the same transaction? They look like the same transaction. And I say, yes, and it's reconciled. So that that's more common, but harder to do if you if you're Walmart. Like think again of the volume of their transactions and how what a challenge it must be to manage all of that. Well, Zip books, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's designed for businesses. There's lots of versions for home finance too. There's Mint, which is put out by Intuit, the people who make QuickBooks, which is free. Does the same thing. You you sign in. It's it's an online system. You sign in through like your Chase account or whatever bank you use. And then it, it, it helps you reconcile and keep those things straight. Some people really like them. Um, okay, so here's an example of a bank statement from Valley National Bank of Los Angeles. Um, I like their attention to detail. They actually used a Los Angeles uh, area code there and zip code, good, good on them, I guess. Um, so you'll probably many of you have had bank statements and not really looked at them very closely. Usually what a bank statement will have is a balance, what dates it covers, and then a summary of deposits and withdrawals, and then other items. And then, so this one has the balance at the beginning of the period, the summary of all those, and then a new balance or a current balance. And then it will have detail of each of these transactions. Okay, um, so that's what a bank statement looks like. More and more, we don't use checks and we use electronic funds transfer for a lot of transactions, right? And I would say um, for my personal checking account, I maybe write three or four checks a year and everything else is done electronically, right? I mean, that's, that's pretty normal at this stage. So, but it's okay, because it's the same idea. The good news is, 
it actually happens faster than with checks, right? If I do an EFT, I'm, I, it's in my account and I don't have to worry about it being missing. Um, in a, so recognize, so here's all the things that banks make uh, in your account. When we say debit on a bank account, this is confusing, but so let me explain this. When we say, a, when a bank says a debit or a credit, what does it mean when they say they've credited your account at a bank? What's it mean to you? It means your account goes up. But wait a minute, isn't cash an asset? So shouldn't a debit increase your account? Right, so what you have to recognize is it's from their perspective, okay? So good job, that was smart. a smart leap. Uh, it is confusing, right? So when they credit your account, it's actually, a liability to them. It's either a reduce in, it's either a reduction in their cash if they pay me interest, or like if I put money into my bank account, every time you put money in your bank account, you're lending money to the bank. Okay. It's it's a loan that you're making to them. They owe it back to you. So they record all of those as all of the deposits they have as credits because it's a liability, money that they owe back to the customers. What a bank's trying to do is get you to 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 put your money in more long-term things like certificates of deposit or savings accounts, because then they can use it more fully than in a checking account where they have to have it on demand, okay? So that's why it's a credit, is because from the bank's standpoint, it's a liability each time you put money in. Um, so they debit uh, the account for those items there, okay? So here's what we have to do. Oh, so this is just kind of showing that exact idea, okay? From the bank standpoint, it's a liability. From your standpoint, it's an asset. All right. Here's a bunch of credit and debit memo entries that you find on a bank statement. EC means error correction. NSF means not sufficient funds. That means if you write a check to somebody and then the bank goes to draw on that check and there's not enough money in your account, you get an NSF, which means Sometimes people say your check bounced, okay? Um, that means that you didn't have enough money in your account. Then usually what happens is they charge you a fee and you still have to pay that person, right? SC is a service charge, ACH. Sometimes you'll see that on your bank statement, ACH, which usually means money coming in. It means automatic clearinghouse, which is a, a third party that handles these transactions between banks, okay? And miscellaneous items. So let me get down to to a reconciliation, so we can get into what we really need to figure out for this chapter. Um, so here's a comparison of your bank statement and your records. So their bank statement ending balance shows three thousand three hundred and fifty nine dollars and seventy eight cents, but the ending balance on their in their books, right? their cash account is $2,549.99. So when we reconcile, what we have to do is figure out what accounts for the differences between these two balances, right? And usually, like I said, it's either gonna be things like, I've written checks, but they haven't yet cleared the account, or I made a deposit, but it's not yet showing on the statement. Or the other side of it is, sometimes the bank does ACH transactions on our behalf that we don't yet have in our books. I'll give you an example. I sold um, all the assets of my storage business about a year and a half ago. And instead of having to, and I carried the note, which means instead of the people paying me all cash, they paid me like 15,000 in cash. And then they're paying me another $130,000 over the next 10 years with interest for these assets I sold them, okay? So, so rather than me having to like write them a bill each month, we just hired a third party and they pay to them and then those people take a little fee and just deposit the rest in my account. So each month, I don't have their payment to me showing up on my, my book records yet. It's not till I get my bank statement and I can see, okay, they re I really did get paid that, that I enter it at that point. So there's another reason why my books might not match up with my bank statement uh, until after I make adjustments that are on the bank statement. Same thing with service charges. If the bank charges you a service fee or if the bank pays you interest, those aren't going to be on your books yet. Not till you get the statement and then you'll be like, oh, 
there's additional items to enter here. Okay. So this is how uh, the format of a bank reconciliation. On the one side, we start with the cash balance according to our bank statement. We add any deposits not recorded by the bank yet. They call those deposits in transit, meaning I've deposited them, but they're not showing up there. We'll deduct any outstanding checks that have not been paid. So checks we've written, but have not yet been paid by the bank. And that will give us an adjusted balance. And then we'll also, uh, and then in the second section, we'll do a cash balance according to our books, according to our company's books. We'll add any credit, credit memos that have not been recorded. So like if the bank collected money on our behalf, we'll deduct any debit memos that have not been recorded, things like NSF checks or service charges. And then at the end, we'll have an adjusted balance. And those adjusted balances have to be equal, okay? So recognize that in essence, we're making adjustments to what the bank balance says for things that are on our records, but not yet on the bank's records. And then we're making adjustments to the book balance for things that were on the bank records, but not yet on our book records. And after those adjustments, it should all balance. All right, so here's the steps. This is how you do this. So this is, I mean, there's a little bit of cash handling stuff I mentioned at the beginning, but the bank reconciliation is sort of the, 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 the big new concept for this chapter, okay? Something we haven't really dealt with yet. So step one, we enter the cash balance according to the bank from the ending cash balance according to the bank statement. I think that's confusing. So we're gonna start by just taking what the bank says is should be the cash balance. Then we're gonna add deposits not recorded by the bank. Then we're gonna deduct outstanding checks. Those are checks we've written, but the, the, the bank has not recorded yet. And then calculate our adjusted balance. I usually call it the adjusted bank balance. Then the company section, we start with the cash balance um, from our books, right? Honestly, you would just look at your your trial balance and what it said for the cash account, that's your cash balance according to your records. Add credit memos that have not been recorded. Deduct debit memos that have not been recorded. Determine the adjusted, I call it the adjusted book balance, the, uh, the, the, the balance of my books adjusted for those items. Then I verify that they're equal and I'm good, okay? So that's the process. So let's look at an example. So here we have a bank statement that shows a balance of 3,359.78. That's a small business if that's the amount that's in their checking account, right? Um, as of July 31st, the cash balance in Power Network's ledger on the same date is 2,549.99. So as expected, there's some discrepancy between the bank balance and the book balance. All right. So here's a couple items. Step two, look for any deposits. There was a deposit on July 31st that was not yet recorded on the bank statement. Happens a lot. You take your deposit down to the bank the last day of the month, they process it, they give you a receipt, but when you get your statement, it's not on there yet. Why? Well, because the statements usually get printed a few days before the end of, you know. So we, they add that in. Then they have outstanding checks. These are checks they've written. So they have a record of them in their, in their cash record, but they're not yet on the bank statement. We also find there's a note receivable of $400 plus interest of $8 that the bank collected on our behalf. So that's things we didn't have in our book yet. Um, and then there's a check from a customer that was returned by the bank because of insufficient funds. Think about that. If your customer writes you a check for $300, when you receive it, you debit your cash account. So then to find out the money didn't come from the bank, you have to take that $300 back off, right? And usually call the customer and yell at them or not really yell, just say like, hey, kind sir, would you be willing to give me the money you owe me? As a business owner, I almost prefer when people write me a bad check to when they just dodge my collection efforts. Because if, if, if someone owes me $300 and I'm calling them and they're just not answering, it's very hard for me to collect that $300. If they have had people like just write me a check to get me off their back and then it, it's non-sufficient funds, then all I have to do is walk down to the courthouse, submit it to the county attorney because writing a bad check is a crime 
and the county attorney's office takes care of it. And you always get paid on those because nobody wants to go to jail over it, right? So the county attorney just writes them a letter that in essence says, did you know it's a crime to write a bad check in our county? You have 90 days to make this right, or we're going to pursue charges against you. And people take care of it usually when they get a letter from the county attorney. I would, right? I'd be like, okay, I'd be borrowing it from my mom if I have to. I don't want to go to jail. Um, I felt a little guilty a couple of times doing that. And they were like, it'd be like for like 500 or $600. And they were like, oh, no, we've had people come in here for like $5 bounce checks and submit it to the county attorney's office. I'm like, I don't know what the threshold is, but $5 seemed a bit low to me even 500, right? Like I'm never going to hate another human being over $500. I'm never going to hate somebody or, or I, I would not, I would not put somebody in jail for $500. Um, but at the end of the day, it's business. And all I want to do is be paid according to the contract we had. And, and that's good. Right. And I want to provide the service that's appropriate. So they had a check from a customer that bounced and a bank service charge of $18. That's not recorded in their journal. Um, in addition, it looks like there was an error, right? Check number 879, which was for $732.26, was recorded in the company's journal at $723.26. So it looks like they just reversed the numbers. So we have to account for that error as well. So our bank reconciliation will look like this. We start with our cash balance according to the bank statement. We add the deposit in transit. Those are those funds that we deposited but weren't yet on the bank statement. We deduct the outstanding checks. And that gives us an adjusted balance. Then we start with our cash balance according to our books, our records. We're going to add the note collected by the bank, deduct the check return because of insufficient funds, deduct the service charge, and deduct the error. Okay. People always get confused on like, should I deduct the error or add the error? And the answer is it depends on the nature of the error, right? If the error is making my account look bigger than it should be, I deduct it. If the error is making my account look smaller than it should be, I'd add it. So that requires a little bit of super sleuthing on your part to be like, what's happening here? So if we look back at it, it says the check was for 73226 but it was recorded as 72326. So what usually happens is you get your bank statement and you're like, you're doing the reconciliation where you're comparing each item. And then you're like, that's off by nine bucks. And then you have to be like, is that an error on me or an error on the bank? So you go in and you, with online banking, you can just click on the transaction and see the check. And sure enough, you see that you entered in your books wrong. Well, you need to do an adjustment to, to take that $9 off your books. Does that make sense? Sometimes the bank had it wrong. So then you have to call the bank and that's actually, you're always happy when it's your error because you can just fix your error. When it's the banks, you have to call and go through this big rigmarole of getting them to, because what they do is they put all those checks through scanners. So occasionally a scanner reads it wrong. And so a human being has to find the check, pull it up, look at it and be like, okay. And then they'll adjust on their end. All right. So after we've done the adjusted balance on the bank side and the adjusted balance on our books, they should match each other. They do we're reconciled. Okay. That's the process. Now the process isn't completely over because these items down here, this note collected service charge, the error, those aren't on our books yet. Okay. That, so we have to, we have to actually add them to our book. We have to actually do a journal entry to enter these items into our book. These items up here, they are already on our books. The issue was they're not at the bank yet but they'll probably get there in the next few days. So our journal entry, we're gonna show our cash increases by $408. Our note receivable will go, will, will go down by 400 and our interest revenue will go up by $8. That'd be the one. And then the second one here. So when someone writes us a bad check, what we have to do is debit accounts receivable. Why? Because that person now owes us the $300 that they supposedly had paid us for. Um, and then the miscellaneous expense, that was for the $18 service charge. Some people will actually have a separate account called bank service charges or bank fees. It just depends on the company. Uh, and then this debit to the accounts payable for Taylor Company uh, because for our, for our error, okay? And then our cash goes down by 327. 
So now after all of those are entered, we're done with the reconciliation process. One other new concept is the idea of what's called a petty cash fund. I just mentioned to you how like with our soccer organization, it just doesn't make sense for us to deal with a lot of cash. It increases the, the likelihood of theft and other issues. But sometimes there are certain small expenses that it just seems silly to have to go through this whole process of getting two people to sign a check. So a lot of companies keep what's called a petty cash fund. And the petty cash fund will be some small amount of, of actual physical cash. Uh, usually for most companies, it's between like $200 and $500 depending on the size of the company. Again, if you think about $200 relative to, a, to even our little soccer that has 70 or $80,000 in revenue coming through there, it's a tiny amount, okay? So what we do is, is, is like legitimately, we have a little metal box, a cash box that has $200 in cash in it, okay? And so instead of having to go through the whole check process, maybe the, the referee administrator will say, man, our youth referees have been really working their butts off for us why don't we buy them some pizza for after the games on saturday and and the the uh, re, the, the regional commissioner who's re, the the responsible admin will say yeah i think that's a great idea so um i'll just run down and buy some pizzas and pay with that cash and then get that receipt and i'll stick it in the cash box and then at the end of the month when we reconcile that i can see does the amount in the cash box add up to the amount of cash that was there plus any receipts? Does that make sense? Some places actually have a little form where you fill out what the expense was for. That's usually actually better, but we're so small, we just use the receipts, okay? So what's a little weird about the petty cash fund is it's, is it's a special type of account called an impressed account. And what that means is, is that we never actually adjust the balance of the petty cash fund again after we've deposited money into it. So the initial transaction to create it would be a debit to petty cash. It's an asset, okay? And a credit to our cash account. That would mean that we like took $500 out of our checking account and put it into this petty cash fund. And then we use it throughout the month, fill out the little form that says what we're using that cash for. Um, and at the end of the month, we go in there and we have these little petty cash receipts or petty cash forms for office supplies of $380, postage of 22, store supplies of $35, and miscellaneous administrative expenses. So we can see that we spent $467 of that cash, okay? Um, and so now at the end of the month, or we replenish it and bring it back up to $500. So rather than doing an entry that shows all of these and then a credit to cash, we just go straight to, we just debit office supplies, store supplies, miscellaneous expenses, and then credit cash directly. So we never bother with the balance of the petty cash account. In this case, um, it looks like we're off by $3, right? Our receipts show that we spent $467, but we have $470 in the account. So again, same idea. We're going to debit each of the accounts that we paid petty cash for, and then we're just going to credit cash. And then any difference is going to be a cash short or over, which again, at the end of the month, we'll make that adjustment as either an expense or a revenue if, if, if we haven't you know, reconciled that fully. Again, which side do I put it on? Well, just put it on the side that makes a balance. Don't let it confuse you too much. So if this side adds up to 467 and cash going down adds up to 470, then I have to put the $3 here to make it be 470 on the debit side. Recognize that that debit, um, that that debit represents in this case, I should have $33 left in this account, but when I go in the box, when I go there, there's only $30. So it was $3 less than it should be. So that being on the debit side means that we're missing $3. We're gonna call that an expense. Again, some businesses would be like $3, which of you employees took it? Most businesses are gonna be like, it's not enough to worry about. Write it off as an expense, move on, okay? All right, one concept here, days cash on hand. This is a way to find out like an average of how much cash you usually have available. This is valuable because if you run out of cash, 
you're kind of dead in the water as a business, right? Your employees love you, but they probably won't work for no, for no pay. Your suppliers love you, but they probably won't keep supplying you if you can't pay them. So knowing how much cash you have on hand on average can help you make other business decisions. So the formula is cash and short-term investments divided by daily cash operating expenses. To find your daily cash operating expenses, you take your operating expenses minus depreciation expense. We haven't got too deep into depreciation expense yet, but recognize that depreciation expense is an expense that you don't pay out in cash. Um, and so you subtract it out of this. Operating ca expenses minus depreciation expense divided by 365 days. And that will give you your daily cash operating expenses. So if you think about it, you're just dividing the amount of cash and short-term money you have on hand by how much you usually have to pay each day. And that's going to give you cash on hand. And that's it. So like I said, the, the, the big new concept is the bank reconciliation. If you follow the steps, it is not bad at all. And then the petty cash, the whole idea that when I replenish it, I don't ever actually debit or credit the petty cash fund. It's just I debit all the expenses and credit cash. And that's the only two new things. And that's really it. So have a great day. Have a wonderful life until tomorrow when I see you again. <laughs>